from our website. Uh, some of you found out because you're patrons of a, a flute shop just around the corner in Warren Street, All Flutes Plus. And those are the folks who organised this little uh, soiree. And uh, Ian Mullen from uh, All Flutes Plus is with us tonight. Like many of the people who work in the shop, they're there to serve you guys and equip you with the, the latest and even the cheapest flute you can find. Um, they're all professional or nearly professional flute players when they're not working in the shop too, so they're all really good players and just the kind of people you want to meet, talk to and find out about the flute, whether you're 10 years old or 50 years old, or as old as you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or me. So yeah, I've been going to all flutes plus for many, many years. They fix my flutes, they sell flutes, and when I get bored with them, I sell them right back to them. <laughs> Somebody else gets to have a go. So what we're going to be doing tonight really is a, it's just primarily talking about the flute, its role in all kinds of music. In my case obviously it's rock music and folk music and even a little bit of kind of jazzy stuff. But of course it's uh, at, a, at home in the, in, the, in the orchestral world and many of you who will have learned to play the flute will have done so by being taught. Um, in my case, not only have I never actually taken a, a driving test, but I've never had a flute test either. Because I don't read music, I just think of it in here and then try and play it. So that's why how I work, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't read the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the, uh, the music manuscript that some of you will have learned to play by. Nothing wrong with that, but, you know, it's in here and it's in here, and you've got to kind of feel the music, feel the groove. So some of the things we'll talk about are the groove in music, the different time signatures, the syncopation, the, the black arts of improvisation. And we should always remember that improvisation is not just the province of jazz and blues and rock musicians, it's, it's the province of jazz, Bach and Beethoven and Mozart, who were incredible improvisers. And uh, in the case of Beethoven and Mozart took part in competitions to see who could outdo the other guy in terms of improvisational skill. The fact that they were the, the great composers, you've got to remember if you were learning some, some Mozart flute concerto, you were learning a piece of music carefully written down from a guy who just made it up in here and probably played it 10 milliseconds later on the piano, because that's how good he was. So improvisation is not just a province of us folks, it's, 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 in, it's embedded in classical music too. So if that's your forte, um, extend yourself, take a chance, take a risk, play some wrong notes. Because that's what will happen if you try improvising, you're going to play lots of wrong notes. But you can only find out which are the right ones if you play some of the wrong ones as well. Am I right? Yeah, we're going to demonstrate that, that later. So, we're also going to take a few questions, uh, but if you have uh, a question, intelligence, uh, or otherwise, if you want to ask me about my life, my background, my musical influences, or whatever, then we'll, we'll get round to that. I'm going to play with the aid of, uh, with this, which is probably the oldest iPod in the world. It works most of the time, but it's a very um, cantankerous beast that unfortunately uh, is, the, um, is where I have the music that I'm going to be using as a kind of backing track stuff. And um, we're going to start off with a, a piece which is, it is it, it, it's like, like most of the things I write, it is kind of, it starts off with improvisation, it starts with just making up a line and thinking, mm, what can I do, with, where can I go with this next? And then it becomes, if not set in stone, at least it starts to establish a, a pattern, a, a definite f firmness in terms of where, where, where it is musically. But it all starts off just by winging it. And then, you know, hopefully I play most of the right notes most of the time. But I, I will certainly, and I'll warn you this right now, I will be playing some wrong notes tonight. And uh, you are going to be hearing them. So first of all, this is a piece um, which is uh, written kind of loosely in the style of Irish. 
French folk music and uh, employed some of the little ornaments and tricks that uh, Irish and Scottish folk musicians do. It's a piece written about the, the art and the science of excessive drinking and how can they not two feet most of the time. I wrote this actually for our bass player Dave Peck, the Fairport Convention, so enough said. He's uh, a man who used to love his drink. Now, this is where I will make lots of little um, tentative starts and stops because um, we have all of this stuff sitting on a backing track of me playing my guitar or sometimes the band playing something in the background. So I'll put the microphone down and we'll get set up and play this piece we call In the Grip of Stronger Stuff. Exponent of phrasing in his uh, sort of jazz inspired music. And um, that's really the art of, of playing the way I like to play, is, is to kind of fool around with the melody a little bit, to slip around, not just play it where other composers might have just put it on the beat all the time. So, an example of that would be this piece. I know you've just had Christmas, the last thing you want is to have to go through all of this again. But, this particular piece is a, an example of how to take a, a common enough tune, one of Christmas's more famous carols that we all sing at Christmas time, and do something with it to turn it around a little bit, put it in that kind of jazzy style that uh, exemplifies what I'm trying to talk about. 
This is a piece called God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen.
being small fish in, in really quite a big pool of excellent guitar players didn't seem like a great recipe for a, a career in music, so I thought maybe I should find something else to play. Preferably an instrument that Eric Clapton can't go near. <laughs> and while he's at it, neither has Jimi Hendrix or any of the other guys. So for no particular reason, I traded in my white Fender Strat to the music store, and uh, they wouldn't give me cash for it, so we'll do a part exchange for something else. And uh, I chose a, a Shure Unidyne 3 microphone, since I thought, well, I'll just have to try and be a singer and not be a guitar player. And then, on a rainy, miserable afternoon in Blackpool, actually living in St. Dines, St. Living it was, um, the sun came out and sort of shone through the window, and, and, and gleaming on the wall, flashing the sunlight back at me, I saw this thing just hanging on the wall on a peg, and it was a, it was a shiny flute, not dissimilar to this one. And uh, I, for no good reason, just said, ah, I'll have that as well. And it was a 30 pound Selma gold seal, absolutely rock bottom beginner's flute. And uh, I didn't have it for, I mean, maybe I played it for two or three years, but it, 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 it went fairly quickly because it broke and it, it was a pig to look after. And many, many years later, I, I found somebody else who'd been the proud owner of a, a Selma gold seal flute when he first began to play flute um, in, uh, in Ireland. It was none other than James Galway. It just coincidentally happened to be his first flute too. And he recently had a landmark birthday and I scoured eBay and the internet generally to try and find an old Selma gold seal flute that I could send it to my friends at All Flute Plus to get all cleaned up and nicely shiny and playing again as a gift for Sir James Galway. But I actually couldn't find one of the damn things. So it just goes to show they're probably all broke. There's a surviving gold seal flute left in the world today. But uh, if there was, it would probably still only be about, worth about 30 quid. <laughs> but that's how it began, Stuart. And um, I was um, kind of, in a way, press ganged into playing it at the Marquee Club in the early days because I, I didn't really fancy my chance of being a flute player especially in front of a, a relatively young and rock kind of audience. So it took a bit of, uh, it took nerves of steel really, the first two or three times I played it in public, but it, it kind of caught on. People liked the idea of it. And um, the flute, of course, it's an instrument that goes back probably about 40,000 years as the oldest surviving bone flute that so far has been dug up. It's, um, you know, it's primitive flute in the early days, just a hollowed out bone or a piece of bamboo or a cane or something, realised they could <coughs> blow into a bit of noise. So it's a very ancient instrument, only, only beaten really probably by percussion, people would have bashed a hollow log and thought that sounds crap but I can be Ringo Starr if I keep working at it, <laughs> or the human voice, which of course is the, the ultimate instrument of all time. But the flute comes um, long before Stradivarius <laughs> and the, the stringed and the plucked and the, and the other blown instruments. So the flute's about as ancient as it gets. And um, when I started playing it, it was, you know, I think I was fairly primitive in my approach and never had a lesson. Didn't know how to hold it. I actually had no idea what all these intricate keys and knobs and buttons and things did. So I figured out pretty early on that some of them didn't really seem to do a lot for me. <laughs> So I got a hacksaw and cut them off. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that I didn't think I needed. And, um, it, it, it made life a little bit easier, I have to say. So that's how I began, and, uh, and many years later, it was, um, it was um, like something I felt obliged to try and learn a bit better, because um, I was a faker. I didn't really play properly. I didn't know the correct fingering. I just just kind of went for it, you know, just did it. And um, later on I thought, maybe I should try and learn the way it should be played. And, um, and I'm still <coughs> aged, whatever, I'm 66 now, I'm still working on it. And that's the great joy of being a musician, is that you can get paid for it if you're lucky enough like me to make a living doing it, but the other days of the week, or the other days of the year, there's probably a hundred days every year when I am an amateur musician. I'm not getting paid for it, I just go and do it for fun. And when doing it for fun, you kind of learn something new every day that you didn't know yesterday. That's, that's the joy of being a musician. 
and I would countenance everybody to, if you are a musician, then don't just think in terms of becoming a professional, getting paid for it, making it your career. Do it because you love it, because you are literally an amateur in the Latin, to love. That's, that's the reason to be a musician. And it's the most rewarding thing in the world to get something back for the effort you put in, and you're just doing it for fun. Maybe you can entertain family and friends, or the dog, or the cat, <laughs> or the next door neighbors who will whinge, moan, and complain. Then that's just a lucky break. If it goes as far as ever getting a weekly wage or making a ton of money or having my tax bill, then that's, that's certainly something you should uh, count as a, an incredible blessing in life. So, I'm going to play a piece which is uh, one that's synonymous with the, the earliest days of my flute playing, actually at the Marquee Club. And um, it wasn't the very first piece of music that I learned to play on the flute, but it was kind of the second one. And it was drawn from uh, a piece of music written by Bach, one that I kept hearing wafting up through the floorboards of my bedsit in Kentish Town, because underneath was a guy who was studying classical guitar, I think in his spare time. But he just laboriously went over the same little bit of Bach's beret over and over and over again, until it had drummed its way into my brain and looked over another flute instrumental to try and play. This one is what came up. I'll follow that up with a little snatch of something that was, uh, I suppose, our famous early moment in the, in the, in the charts when the unlikely song in 5-4 time signature, ooh, the second time in living history as a, as a piece of music in 5-4 made it into the top 10. This is a piece called Living in the Past. And, uh, but first we'll, we'll have a go at Bure. One, two, one, <laughs>
music do you like to listen to? Ooh, what music do I like to listen to? I know a lot of music listeners. If you do, I, I mean, I've just spent, God knows, um, since uh, I came back from Prague, beginning of November, apart from Christmas Day and Boxing Day, I've actually worked every single day um, doing the rehearsals and recording of a new album, the mixing, the mastering. I finished yesterday. And here I am again. I thought I was going to have a night off. <laughs> but no, it's, it's, if you do this all the time, or a lot, then I'm not really a great music listener. I, I mean, I've just spent, I don't know how many hours in the last week listening again and again and again and again to the same tracks on the album, checking for little clicks or glitches and clunks on the fade and the leading times of different tracks, checking the P and Q points with the CD master and the 5.1 surround. I had to go through all of that yesterday. So listening to stuff for fun is not something I'm very good at. But I am going to show you at the end of this little session a bit of music, a couple of pieces of music from somebody that I vaguely know and played with a man called Seth Layton, a folk musician. Because sometimes I don't actually really listen to music in the sense of lying back, closing my eyes and just listening to it. I, I feel compelled to play along. <laughs> so I sent Seth Layton an email yesterday saying, it's okay if I play along to a couple of songs from your albums, just to show that playing along is a lot of fun. And it involves playing wrong notes, finding out where, where it's going next, and just uh, So I deliberately have not really listened to these songs other than I'm sort of vaguely familiar with them. I wrote down what key they're in, that's about it. But we'll, we'll try playing along to those, and, and just to demonstrate that that is much better than just listening, is getting to join in with people you really like, like Seth Layton, who's a very talented uh, and relatively young, damn it, musician. So, yeah, that's what I do. I don't really listen, I feel compelled to see what I can do to mess up their very nice tune. Whoever it is, another one. Okay, yeah, well, we're very, very good. Can I take the lady here? Hello. Yeah, can I ask you about your finger? My finger? Your finger's finger. Yeah. Is it the back? Because I know oh. with the E flat key. Yeah, it's, um, I, I have a problem with it though. I'm born with a bent finger. Right. And so, it, it is a, it kind of works a bit. You know, I can get it to, it, it, it works a bit, but it's very unreliable. It is, okay. however, However, it is an important finger to use <laughs> if you're playing the flute. And um, so, yeah, quite, quite most of my unforced errors are, uh, are to do with this little finger. Not all of them, I, but it, it does excuse, I think, some of the times when it just doesn't work. It just seizes up. And I know what I'm asking it to do. It just won't budge. And other times it goes, whoop, and you don't want it to. <laughs> so, yeah, the E flat key and the, and the key work at the bottom is a, is a bit, uh, is a bit, you know, a bit hit or miss for me, I have to say. But it's my, more or less my only visible deformity. Yeah. But, <laughs> but thanks for noticing. <laughs> So, yeah, that's good. Well, time signatures, we talked about that. And you, know, you, can, you can write pieces of music as I do in odd time signatures. And I, I love, you know, five is a groove for me. And um, seven is a kind of a groove. And nines and elevens, you can kind of stretch to, but you've got to be paying attention when you get to the end of it. If it's an eleven eight bar, you really got to be concentrating. And the trouble is, time signatures can just be clever for the sake of being clever. When it's driven by the melody, when it's driven by the essence of the music, then it's excusable to, to, to write pieces that are you know, a little more complex in terms of time. But just to sit there and think, well, I'm a clever guy, I can, uh, I can play some weird time signature just to impress you, it's, it's really not the point of what it's about. So that is hopefully behind a piece of music that I'll, in fact, I'll play, play two pieces for you which are in complex time, that they, they, they drift around between in the case of the first one, you know, sevens and nines, and in the case of the next one, it's uh, a lot of fives and sevens and, and stuff that is uh, driven by the melody. That, that's the thing that it starts with, and then you find a way to build a repeating pattern that have little motifs that will come back and repeat again. And so it gets set in stone. It gets written down ultimately by the other musicians that I work with. They usually read music. They, they, they write it all down bar by bar and learn it that way. Me, I just try and remember it. And uh, that's sometimes quite difficult, but I will amply prove to you right now. This is a piece, uh, first of all, called Urology, and based around a few notions of little musical ideas from 
Eastern Europe as it emerged from the, the doldrums a few years ago. <laughs> songs, it's um, sometimes the lyrics are the thing that kicks it all off, and usually on a good day, if I'm writing words, the tune presents itself pretty much at the same time, so I may not know exactly where it's going, but I have the shape of something, and that's the best way for me to write when words and music come more or less together, a line at a time, you kind of know where you're headed. But sometimes it was an instrumental piece, you have to tell a story just using pure musical notes. And I have a friend, a flautist in Italy, Italy's finest flautist, a great uh, artist who specializes in Mozart flute concertos, I think she's recording many, all. Um, he's a, a nice chap, good looking, Italian stud, by the name of Andrea Griminelli. And when I first met Andrea, he was a bit down in the dumps, he was um, rather sad so. And, um, I felt compelled to write a piece of music for him. I, I said, what, what's wrong, Andrew? He looked so sad as well. My, my girlfriend, uh, she um, had been going out for many years. She, um, she walked out to me. She left me. Probably for another flute player. <laughs> With a bigger flute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And so to cheer Andrea up, I thought, I'll write him a piece of music that'll, you know, be sort of uplifting and cheerful and bring him out of the doldrums. So I decided I would, and I did, and I called it Griminelli's Lament. <laughs> so it's kind of a sad piece. It brings together elements of Celtic folk music with a kind of Italian romantic sort of notion. Some year or two later, when I met up with Andre again, and we were playing on a concert together, we, uh, we actually played this as a, as a duet. And Andre was really pleased that we had this piece to play together, and uh, lo and behold, the girl in question that had walked out on him, she turned up at the concert. And, um, and Andrea played this piece with me, and afterwards she ran over to him and threw her arms around me. Oh, Andre, it was wonderful, I love the piece of music, and go uh, take me back. He said, F off, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Almost to that effect. No, I'm, I'm making that bit up. But it was, but she, no, she really was at the concert. She looked pretty good. So I'm going to ask Ian Mullen to join me here to, uh, to play Criminelli's event. And as I said, Ian's one of the chaps at All Flutes Plus. So. <laughs> just to inspire a new generation of flute players, really, that isn't just coming from a classical background. Uh, I think it would just be it's just a really worthwhile thing for the shop to get involved with and try to organise events like this. But uh, on a personal note, um, I, I started the flute maybe when I was 10. Um, I probably heard James Galway on the radio when I was very young. Um, there's also one of my other heroes here today, actually, who um, is William Bennett. 
who uh, is the reason why I went to the Royal Academy. Wow! I heard him when I was 14. At my, he came to do a concert at my school in uh, Bristol Cathedral. And, um, and I was inspired ever since that day. And then I auditioned to the Academy and managed to get in. Um, so it's a great privilege to have Whip here as well today. Um, but it's just, you, you meet so many amazing people along the way. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the few people that I've, I've had that have inspired me to play with you. Great. And I must just ask, I mean, we, we, we all know, apart from William Bennett, who's one of the, I guess, the all-time greats, not just a player, but a teacher and communicator of the, of the whole thing, but we all know, I suppose, James Galway, he, he came to fame with, um, at least in the popular mind, not as a classical musician so much, but by doing renditions of, you know, more popular work, like... Um, Annie's song. Annie's song, and... Um, I <laughs> Oh, Danny boy, that thing, yeah. And, um, and, and, but he, he, he's still playing after all these years. And I, one useful thing that, that James Galway did tell me, he, he, lo he loves to, James loves to fiddle with flutes. He's a total anal obsessive when it comes to flutes. He's got drawers full of flutes, and his great passion is to have people come and visit him in his home in Switzerland and try out some head joints, <laughs> which is this bit that you blow into. And, and this is like this obsessive thing about trying to find the perfect flute, the perfect head joint. And James can play any flute and make it sound great. Any student model flute, you can pick it up, it still sounds like James Galway. It's not the flute, it's the guy behind it who, who makes the noise. But one thing he told me, and I really believe this, and I've come to find this out for myself in, in recent years, is that just because you happen to be pretty good at what you do, it's never time just to sit back and say, oh, I'm a flute player. Mm -hmm. Any more than you can sit back and say, I'm a Formula One race driver, therefore I know what to do next season. Every time it's out there learning, the learning curve gets steeper the older you get and the more you face challenges from technology, from other people. James practices every day. And that's a real good object lesson for all of us in whatever walk of life we're in. Don't just think you know everything. Goodness me, if your doctor, if your GP thinks he or she knows everything about the medical profession and doesn't keep up to date with the latest drugs, the latest technology, the latest advances in medical health, he could kill you. <laughs> so GPs, I, I met some of these guys, they just think they know it all. They, they spent you know, eight years studying all this stuff. Yeah, I know how to do doctoring. Well, you don't, you've got to keep learning. It's, if you're a flute player, it's the same deal. James practices every day. And he told me, the older you get, the more you have to practice. You've got to stay on top of your game. You've really got to keep things working. Don't give up. Don't just settle back into a quiet, sort of slumber-like life and expect you to go out there and play some really, really difficult flute music, which, of course, the guy does. So, James Colby, good lesson that he taught me to practice every day. And I do pretty much practice every day. Not necessarily the flute, but you know, strumming a guitar or writing a song or doing the other things that I do. Now, improvise, we did talk about Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, and uh, a while ago I, I was in Israel, I think, and I, I played with a, a musician there who asked me to accompany him playing the piano. He was going to play um, Bach's Prelude in C major, a piece of music that I guess is fairly common, especially for people learning piano. And, um, and he said, well, just make something up. And I thought, right, so I listened to, he sent me a tape of him playing the piano part, and I, I thought, okay, well, I don't know what Bach would have done with this if he'd been asked to come up with a flute line, but clearly I've got to do something that doesn't tear it to pieces. It's got to observe the, the piano part and work along with it. So I came up with something which began, again, just by playing along, improvising along with the Bach piece, and then it settled down into more or less a fixed uh, notion of little tunes that, that work alongside. Bach's Prelude. So I'm going to play that for you now, um, and it's, um, in a way, I suppose makes for me something that I, Bach might be really pissed off, I don't know, <laughs> but my theory is, I mean, it's a good theory, my theory is he would actually say, oh, yeah, not bad, I quite like that. <laughs> if I thought of it, I would have done it better, but not bad, not bad, not bad for an old guy playing the flute. So, we mustn't be stubborn, we mustn't be fussy about fiddling around with classical music. It all got there in the first place because somebody fiddled around and came up with the ninth, the ninth Symphony. Beethoven didn't just 
you know, sit down and laboriously put this together. He was filled with passion and fury and anger and put it all together in the, in the crowning glory of his life's work. And, but it all began sitting at a piano and just noodling, just noodling. and send you screaming into the night so your last tube or in my case a train on Great Western Railways out yes. west where I live hello yes hello Ian um, out of all your albums which is the most proud one you're most proud of well, the usual answer that people give to that is the one they've just finished making, which is kind of obvious. But I suppose, in, in some ways, it, it goes back really to the, the music that... Um, the ones where I felt I was facing a bit of a challenge, you know, to learn something new that I couldn't do before. So there are some along the way. I think probably the first one that I'm proud of is really the second album in 1969 called Stand Up. Because that was where I embraced some ideas from outside the world of blues, which is what I was really doing when I was a teenager, and found things from the world of classical music, from folk music, from Eastern music, um, which came together in a, in a kind of an eclectic uh, mix of things that made it uh, not exactly a rock album, but certainly an eclectic. And I think we called it pro we called it progressive rock music back in 1969. That term first got used, but then of course it took on rather dark and hideous overtones with the likes of Emerson, Lake and Palmer and Yes and other bands became sort of filled with this sort of anal noodling and complex music just for the sake of seeming to be rather clever and showing off to their peer group musicians. Not to say they didn't do some very, very fine and great music along the way, but I never really wanted to get quite into that. I kind of like the groove, so stand-ups, good, eclectic, but not too clever, fairly basic. Um, sorry for that one. Well, it was um, actually my manager, Terry Ellis, at the time, liked to do a hell of a bit of input in the album covers, and he commissioned a, an artist, um, James uh, Grosh, I can't remember his name now, New York based uh, graphic artist who specialised in, in woodcuts. And um, so he did, the, uh, he did the kind of woodcut drawing and then the the little pop-up thing, which I think actually was Terry Ellis's idea. Um, I <coughs> found it a bit embarrassing itself, but it was, you know, something that it did, it did obviously make the album stand out and up from the crowd. And, and many years later, the album title Stand Up got used again by um, an American artist who obviously was too young to remember <laughs> that <laughs> it had actually been a number one album in the UK at the time, but um, and did pretty well in America, but it, 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 it's one of those titles that I, I don't think I felt particularly great about. The next album, Benefit, I didn't like that one either. That was one of Terry's ideas, and it, as indeed was his, his album cover. But the um, Thick as a Brick was, was mine. That was, that was my <laughs> contribution to the, the zany album covers and uh, complex um, artwork ideas. Um, yeah, but then going on from that, I mean, the, probably, I don't know, Songs from the Wood, another great one. The Aquila album has lots of songs on that I'm, you know, very, very proud of and happy to play to this day. Um, Crest of an A in the mid 80s, the one that won the, uh, the, the, the Grammy for being best heavy metal album. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't heavy metal at all, it was, it was kind of a mixture of stuff as usual. And, um, I think they just gave it to us. They, they, we, we won the Grammy not for being the best heavy metal band. It was just, you know, won it for being, um, I suppose, um, you know, the best one-legged flute player at the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was. Um, yeah, there's, there's a few favourites along the way, and uh, I, I still like to dream at least that the album I'm going to make next year or the year after will be the one that is going to be 
universally acclaimed as my best work. But as we all know, we live in a world where people like to savour the delights of uh, memory lane, nostalgia, and the blue comfort blanket reigns supreme. And so the Rolling Stones, in fine fettle they may be, but if they were to go into the studio and spend six months or a year making a new studio album, it would be released to complete disinterest. Nobody wants a new Rolling Stones album. They might want a new old Rolling Stones album in the sense that it was a bunch of songs that sounded like Brown Sugar and Jumping Jack Flash and all that stuff. But no one really is that interested in the so-called heritage rock bands new material and I, I'm trying to buck that trend by constantly you know, doing things that are really kind of in your face. You may not like it, but it's what you're going to get. You don't have to buy it after all. So the new one called Homo Erraticus, which really translates as the wandering man, is the story of all of us. We're all from somewhere else. It's about migration. We're all from somewhere else. Get over it. <laughs> That's what the art is about. Kind of topical stuff in some ways, but um, still done with a wry sense of humour, so it doesn't get too up its own bottom. Sorry, sorry for this. Um, bad boys, for that matter. Okay, so the Bodil piece, which is um, an example of the um, of playing along to Seth Leighton, as I mentioned. And we'll do Seth Leighton's piece, which is called Coppinger, or Coppinger, Coppinger? Um, I've got a feeling this is one of his shipwreck songs, because Seth Leighton comes from the West Country, and um, he's kind of the folk singer of today that I guess I wish I, you know, I, I, I would be. You know, he's, in some ways he writes music that I feel very, uh, sounds familiar to me. I kind of know where this guy's going with his next move. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that because I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, screw up mightily guessing is what he does. I do know it's in the key of G. I wrote that bit down. <laughs> Seth plays, by the way, interestingly, he doesn't play the flute, he plays the fiddle admirably, but his main instrument is actually a bit of a favourite of mine. It's the tenor guitar. The tenor, which is probably what the first one that he bought cost, is, has only four strings. So it's, it's kind of like a, it uses mandolin chords, it uses the, essentially you can, it, it's, like a, it's like a big boy's violin really, that you play with a pick and strong chords. So very simple chords, and you can very quickly retune it to use alternative open tuning. He specialises in, so a lot of open tonality about his work, so sometimes you can be a little loose in interpretation and, you know, a lot of open chords that don't have the major third or a minor third, and you can kind of float around in his, his stuff. So th this one, I do know it's in G, we'll give it a go, it's called Coppinger, and see what happens. Stop to 
few years ago, one of his earlier albums, a very fine tune called The White Hair. And um, I'll just play along with that one just by illustrating something a little bit more. Uh, less frenetic. Sort of improvisational approach. He said to me, 
he didn't really didn't want to do this because he's a proper musician and he plays <laughs> he plays the notes what's written down. We just ran through a few bars of this um, this afternoon when we first arrived, and, uh, and you know he, he he knows what he's doing, and um, all he needs to know, as I said to him, is that it, it's in E minor. So really, you've just got a bunch of notes to think. This is what I got to fool around with, you know, an E, an F sharp, a G, a, an A to a B, maybe even maybe even the B flat can sneak in there. <laughs> C sharp's kind of important, probably. <laughs> Have you remembered all of that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Okay, this is a this is another piece. Um, I, kind of, I believe one of his well-known songs. This is a Seth Lakin piece called "Poor Man's Heaven," and I'll just dial it in if I can find it. Oh, nice. Not that one, you fool. <laughs> So I'll play some bits and you join in, I'll give you some knocks. Okay. Four bars, eight bars, whatever we get around to doing.
that's an example you said how you can have fun just jamming along to other stuff. Did I say fun? It's somewhere between fun and abject terror. <laughs> That was good! Yeah. Were you having fun? Are you were having yeah, fun. Was I could see. Yeah. I could see you were having yeah. fun. I got a bit of a stiff in the middle of that. <laughs> uh, we'll just finish up with one piece, which is a piece we've been doing to children and children and still doing it. Um, this one is um, I'm the Jim Davidson of the flute, by the way. <laughs> so, sometimes it gets a little blue. Um, so the uh, yes, the, the, the one that we finish off concerts with since probably 1971 when the song first appeared. It's a piece called Locomotive Breath. And this was actually the original. <laughs> the original backing track, which um, um, I found when we found all the old masters. And, um, and I just took my voice off and flute off it. And this is actually the original thing with John Evans playing the intro. It's rather quiet, so I'll have to turn this one up a bit.
Anyway, listen, thanks very much indeed for coming. I hope that explained or confused you in regard to a little bit of the otherworldly side of flutes, the, the black art of improv and fooling around and having fun, which is what I've been getting paid for for the last 45 years, and long may it continue. Thanks again, see you next year. Sometimes, I think... That looks rather good. I throw a few shapes. Better practice again.